So I'm sort of picking up really on a theme that we've already covered with um, archaeological genetics. And I'm kind of seeing the other side of that. Once you've got the genetic information, what do you actually do with it? What new questions can you ask, ask of it? And how can we, can we enrich the record? Um, and so in doing that, I'll, I'll use sort of Neanderthals as a case study. Really. I can't cover all of early prehistory, but I kind of see it in this kind of way. So the green stuff at the top is that new infusion of science. We're starting to get um, tight paleopathological case studies published as case studies. So the idea is you publish what this thing is, and that's it. You don't really publish a bigger interpretation of the significance of um, the particular disease or trauma the individual had. It's trying to establish what it is. DNA, ancient disease uh, profiles, uh, and congenital conditions that have a DNA component, which gives you a really strong baseline to work from about what a thing is we've seen in the archaeological record. Uh, and it doesn't always agree with what we thought, so usual sexing data, exactly as Sophie mentioned with um, uh, the upper Paleolithic burial, exactly <coughs> that, a replacement of the sex, which changes the archaeological interpretation, our theories around um, relationships in the Gravettian. Um, so this is very significant. Uh, and I think on top of that, you've got a new raft of approaches, which is where I'm coming at this from. So, so I'm wearing my very much theory hat here. I would usually do the same sort of this penny really, flip between the two. But for this project, I'm very much the theoretician. I'm not a paleopathologist. I'm not a DNA person. Please don't ask me questions about that. Now, I am sort of a more theoretical person. I'm doing things with that data, which is very exciting. Um, and that is sort of healthcare, this new question of what we can do with DNA and uh, paleopath data. I'm going to look at small scale and big scale stuff and I think that's my main point here. Scale is really interesting from the point of view of this type of data and I would argue you have different theoretical notions you can bring to bear related to your particular research questions and those research questions are novel by virtue of what this data affords you. So the integration is really important. So I'll start with the small scale. Um, and of course, I've got reference here to a colleague of mine, Monotilli's work, which is excellent. You should all read it. It's very good. Um, which is a four-stage model uh, of how you can try and plot from uh, an observed um, paleopathological signature, a broken arm, a uh, congenital condition, or what have you, the broader social significance of that signature. Was somebody cared for or not? Could they be independent and look after themselves? How can we tell that? How can we pin that down? Um, how can we build a framework that is um, rigid and repeatable, and we can try and figure that out across different uh, bodies of evidence. Um, so this is great. It reminds me a lot, actually, thinking so of my theory hat on, of object biography. Uh, it has that real flair to it about a tight reading of, in this case, an object, which happens to be a body. It's slightly more formulaic and rule-based, but in essence, you kind of get the same output. It's a little bit more strict and focused around the human body and then uh, a type of social performance, if you like. Um, so for me, this has all the hallmarks of object biography, which is wha exactly why I like it, because I can kind of understand it. Um, so this is very useful, I found, when trying to think about particular individuals, their life, um, and, and how others might have interacted with them within a small-scale mobile society, which is exactly what I want to be able to do as a Paleolithic archaeologist by training. This is what is, is exciting, to access actual people um, from their, their health and their skeletal data, and to think in a much more rich, nuanced, and contextual way. And this is the key for me. Context through Tilly's approach, this small, almost individual skill is essential, and that also appeals to me as well. Um, and it's built from data. What that means is, whatever wonderful theory I make up from this, um, make up is maybe the wrong word, but possibly, um, it's still contingent on that data. Now, if there's a new technique, the data changes, my argument collapses like a house of cards as well. It's completely fused. I'm completely aware of that, okay? I'm not a paleopath person, and I'm not a DNA person. What I am is a theory person doing some theory stuff, okay? I'm trying to get more out of it, more bang for your book. So, what does that look like? I can build sort of a table here of, say, Sean I won that famous case study example of Neanderthal healthcare. In this case, I've built the safe words, of course, short publications, we're all cursed by, of course. Stage one, stage two, and stage three of Tilly's work into uh, this table of what happened to Sean Darwin. Uh, what that likely had in terms of an impact in their life, and then stage three, possibly what people did based on their particular contextual realities. 
They're mobile. What happens when somebody breaks their leg? What's well, a big deal if you're mobile? Okay, so the contextualization allows you to get to stage three, and of course, you publish the right of the interpretation, which sounds very, very much like a biography of what happened to that person in a particular moment. And of course, with Shana Dao One, thank you very much, Sophie. With Shana Dao One, classic example, possibly blind in uh, one eye, the left eye, possibly deaf in one ear, the left ear, and possibly at the removal of the forearm through amputation, and um, probably high amounts of pathology in the legs uh, with supplementary. Uh, issues in one leg which compensated for issues in the other leg um, and so very pathologized and yet one of the oldest Neanderthal individuals we know 40 plus years and a sustained pathological signature of about 20 years so this is not something that happened at the very end of the person's life this is something that was there for a protracted period and got worse and yet they survived healthy no obvious sort of dietary shift here from one group to the other and we can perhaps start to build a sense of richness in the social interpretation of how that happened and presented there with an archaeological reality. This person with these techniques that science has revealed are so to break like this, it takes that long to heal, that's how bones work. What then do we do, how, what narrative do we spin around that about social relationships thousands of years ago? And I would argue we can start to move into those more ephemeral aspects, emotional relationships in a different species. How do they feel about this? How do they experience that? How do they help each other over such a long period of time? Why not just bash them on the head and finish them off? Why did that not happen? That would have been really sensible because they've got a broken leg, right? But they didn't do that. They did something else instead. And it's actually from the, the, the rational logic of the data that can build a, a tight framework to ask the right questions that I can reveal then the social richness of this signature. The healing of it is the significant bit here. Um, so I find this perpetually fascinating at this scale. And it's a scale I like to work at. The small scale where you can get moments in time, particular individuals and what happened to them. But I think there's a different scale here as well, and we've tried to work in this bigger scale too. Here I shift focus to the population level, in this case, a human evolutionary narrative, the place of Neanderthals in our story, human uh, and more broadly hominin, uh, and, and quite how, how that's played out. So that capacity for healthcare, interpersonal care, to take on at a cost to help another, how did that spring up? Why did that happen? Is that different between earlier hominins? Is it different to what humans did in the Paleolithic as well? And how can we tell that? Well, actually, it's the same DNA evidence, I would argue, and it's the same tight osteological analysis and paleopath evidence, which you can then plot with big data. Let's put it all on the map, let's see what happens, let's look for patterns. Let's think about then a bigger tier of question. Where are they? What were they doing? How are they adapted? Why are they there? How could they survive? In this case, we're thinking about northern latitudes. Now, the interesting about northern latitudes is it's cold. Congratulations, we're here, it's winter. I'm correct, huzzah. The challenges then are close range hunting and uh, the danger embedded in that. If you're a hyper carnivore, and Neanderthals probably were, you have a lot of big game interactions. If you're doing that at close range, it doesn't matter how good you are, eventually you're going to get unlucky. You might, you might get gored by an angry bison, kicked by a particularly wild horse, or whatever. Okay. Now what happens when that happens? And given that, over a vast amount of time, hundreds of thousands of years, this is going to be very, very common. Well, you have to have a pretty good strategy in place. This creates an evolutionary pressure. And here I'm talking then about evolutionary theory from the same body of data, but at a different scale to give me a different product, okay? But it's essentially the same ingredients mixed in here. So what happens then, I would argue, uh, is that is that exactly this. You can start to build in evolutionary insights about how this evolved, where these pressures came from, why Neanderthals, when they have very high rates of trauma, how they managed to compensate with that. So hyper care, perhaps in this case, that they care for everybody for protracted periods. How do we test that? Different question, scale it down. Let's look at a, a pathologized individual like Shanada One. What happens there? Cared for for decades. Okay, so we can see that, we can evidence it at a different scale, okay, with a different theoretical tool set using the same data. Okay? Uh, and so for me then again, you potentially then answer this bigger question of the place of Neanderthals in that human evolutionary narrative. In this case, wonderfully complex, adapted to a northern latitude with high risks of personal injury, uh, but with very good chance that you're going to get cared for by a broader community. As we can see, case by case, when we drill down to Lonnie's bioarchaeology of care. And I think this sort of sums that up. There are real challenges in a northern temperate environment. There are real additional <coughs> risks, and this is where the source of pressure comes from. 
for me, it's exactly this northern latitude, close range uh, encounter hunting, which engenders that risk. Uh, the response to it, um, sort of the, the evolutionary direction that we're pushed in then, is for some kind of behavioural response, social strategy built around this, high levels of interpersonal care, just to be able to survive in a northern latitude. The simple test, the invitation here is to do the same thing with humans, which is what I'll do next um, after this project is finished. So, I would argue that theoretical tools can provide new root ways, I just think about early hominins at different scales, but ultimately fused to that scientific data that shifts, new methods come along, so too do my ideas. Um, that data then is essential, but I'm building from and enriching it, so they're integrated completely. I can't do without that data. I need these new techniques. It gives me the resolution I need to be able to do this far richer take on this old signature. It stops me assuming, it makes me ask the right questions. And I think you can do it as a small scale person or as a large scale person. And of course, my early sort of human evolutionary take on this is irrelevant from your point of view. Run with that yourself in your period as well. From your healthcare, health, pathology was there, ever present, and these tools will work regardless of period, I think. Less of the human evolution stuff, certainly the biological care stuff. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.